and many yes. good friends there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, yeah, fortunately, we're, we're passing, uh, although the, uh, the pandemia, we are, we were discussing this before uh, at the time that you left. Although all the problems that we are facing, we are being capable of keeping transplantation in a, in a certain level. So uh, yeah, we thought that we would decrease. Well, yeah, hopefully, um, you know, we had many sessions at the Transplantation Society about COVID and transplantation yeah. outcomes and, and how to protect your patients. So, um, yeah, a lot of it's common sense, but I think there are some um, takeaway messages regarding reduction of CNI exposure. Oh, keep, I'm sorry, reduction of MMF and, and keeping the CNI exposure uh, at, a, at, a, at a normal level so that patients don't reject. But anyway, hopefully it'll go away. Yeah, what do we notice in our patients that a patient, the uh, liver transplanted, transplant patients that had COVID infection, most of them did well mm -hmm. and they fully recovered. While the, the kidney re re receptors, it was very different the reality for them, especially for the ones that were in the early postoperative time, you know? So uh, yeah. one patient in for the first or second month, they really didn't do that well compared to the liver ones. Yeah, our lung transplant patients also haven't done that well. They, but um, you know, I think we've gotten a lot better about managing our patients with COVID in terms of uh, avoiding, that, uh, avoiding the ventilator, uh, changing the, the position and anticoagulation and, and steroid use. I think all of those have been very helpful. Yeah. Um, but you know, overall mortality rate here in the United States for COVID, even though the COVID volume keeps going up, the, the, the mortality rate is dropping, but still we have over 205,000 deaths. So we'll see, maybe next year I'll come visit. Yeah, sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I um, my talk will be about uh, thirty five minutes long. Okay. I hope that's satisfactory. I'm happy to answer any questions, but if they ask in Portuguese, you'll have to um, <laughs> translate for me. Well, we we're gonna do it like so, sir. Uh, we have this the chat. So, uh, Doctor Silvana, we will be uh, reading the chat since. If any chat is not on English, it's going to make the translation for you. Okay? Okay, very good. Okay. So, uh, we can start in the time you want. So, uh, okay, well, anytime you want to start. Okay, just... Uh, Certain time. Here. Just checking the I was here. Okay, is this okay for you, sir? Yeah, I think that'll be fine. Um, uh, do, uh, do you mind? I uh, just would like to make a, a quick presentation about sure. you, sir, for yeah, the uh, go ahead for everybody. So, um, so I'd just like to introduce uh, Professor Fung, which is one of the pioneers of transplantation in general. Uh, and uh, we had this unique opportunity to have him with us tonight which is uh, we are very, very proud of this opportunity and to have him with us tonight. So uh, Professor Fung is now the, uh, the coordinator and the, uh, the head of the uh, Surgical Transplantation Chicago University at the present time. And in his lecture is going to be about liver transplantation, the manager of HCC, which is uh, what I asked him is to... Uh, make this conference on, on this subject, subject and try to compare uh, 
the different uh, ways of dealing with this in the East and West schools or transplantation nowadays, because we have a very different way of dealing with this subject in Eastern countries, especially in Asia. And uh, I think we can discuss about it afterwards. So Professor Funga, once again, thank you very much indeed. I hope to have the opportunity in the future to meet you personally <laughs> once all this passes. And thank you once again, sir, anytime you want for your presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Nicolisi. It's very uh, nice to be uh, with you tonight. I uh, have many Brazilian friends and, and patients from many years ago, and, and I love Brazil. So uh, you. hopefully you're keeping safe from the COVID. Um, we're not doing a very good example in the United States of how to take care of uh, and control COVID, but don't learn from the U.S. Um, but I'm going to talk tonight just about sort of the general topic on liver transplantation in HCC. Um, there are many aspects of, of uh, how you manage and evaluate patients and, and downstage them and treat them post-transplant. Uh, and I'll cover some of that, but obviously, you know, this is a very complex topic and in 30 minutes, I don't expect to cover everything, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And in the chat section, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, next slide. So I think all of you know, and, and certainly in Brazil, if you look at your country in terms of the incidence of worldwide, uh, of HCC compared to the worldwide uh, incidence, it's somewhere in the middle, um, about uh, six cases per 100,000. Obviously in Asia where hepatitis B is a big problem, hepatitis C in Japan, uh, it's a bigger problem. But you'll see that uh, we share uh, similar um, characteristics in terms of prevalence. Although I think uh, in, the, in Brazil, there's still a lot of hepatitis B related HCC in the United States. It's changed to primarily uh, fatty liver disease associated uh, and alcohol associated HCC. Next slide. So these are all the surgical options, I mean, I mean, I mean therapeutic options for management of patients with HCC. Uh, they include medical therapy, gene therapy, surgical therapy, local regional therapy, and you, it's giving you a whole list of them. And we'll talk a little bit about some of them. And particularly, I think, as we have evolved our management of patients with HCC, uh, we are using combinations of therapies. Next slide. So as it relates to the approved therapies for HCC, this is uh, a grading scale I think you're very familiar with in terms of level of ed evidence with le level one being the best level of evidence. And the grade of recommendation again, one being very strong and number and two being weak, that uh, the use of uh, serafinib, chemoembolization, liver transplantation within Milan criteria, liver resection, have all had pretty good level of evidence that those are effective therapies and a strong uh, grade of recommendation for their use in patients with HCC. You can see that the other ones in terms of extended criteria uh, for liver transplantation uh, outside Milan criteria, the use of radiotherapy, internal beam or external beam radiation, uh, those are a little less strong, but I think uh, as I'll show you, there is um, increasing evidence in terms of the application of these things like downstaging. You see downstaging having uh, lower a grade of recommendation and lower uh, evidence, uh, level of evidence. Next slide. Nicole. Sorry, sir. So I think all of you are also familiar with the Barcelona Clinic, their liver staging, uh, liver cancer staging classification and the recommendations for therapy. Um, so early stage disease in a good uh, child's A and B, uh, you can see that these patients have, um, if you follow them all the way down, liver resection for those patients with early stage disease and intact liver function tests. Patients that have, on the other end, uh, terminal uh, advanced stage disease, stage D, um, 
that are not expected to live very long. There's no effective therapy, the palliative therapy. And in between, we have liver transplantation, the use of local regional therapy and chemotherapy. And I think this um, algorithm was useful maybe 10 years ago. And I'm not sure that I would agree now that uh, the application of liver transplantation should be broadened. And this is because evidence that um, use of uh, local regional therapies, uh, radiotherapies, as well as some of the new immunosuppressive agents can really expand the indication for liver transplantation for patients with more intermediate stage HCC. Next slide. So comparing liver transplantation to other local regional uh, surgical therapies, this is an old paper from uh, Al Sarag almost uh, 15 years ago. And the, the data collected from his series was actually much longer than that, over 20 to 25 years ago. And you can see that um, compared to um, surgical resection, uh, radiofrequency ablation, the use of transarterial chemoembolization, and other kinds of therapies, including um, medical therapy, that liver transplantation has the best median survival, the lowest 30-day uh, mortality, and the best three-year survival rates. Now, you'll see here that, we're, that we quote a three-year survival rate of 41% for transplantation. And you'll see that obviously this has changed quite a bit. Uh, we now expect survival rates in the 60 and 70, 80% at three years. And I'll, I'll show you that data. But still, even this experience showed that liver transplantation was a favor that had the most favorable survival rates. Next slide. So this goes back to one of the early studies by Henri Bismuth in his own series in Paris, when they looked at patients with a resection versus transplant. And you can see that the patients that had transplant had higher child's B or C classification with more nodules, larger nodules. And you can see that at the three-year survival range, uh, and this is very old data from the 80s and 90s, they had only a 50% survival rate, which was comparable to resection outcomes. But what was different was that the liver transplant patients, we knew from that, just that series many years ago, had better uh, disease-free survival. In other words, recurrences for patients that had a resection was much higher than resection, uh, recurrences in patients that had transplant. Next slide. So graphically shown, um, you can see in the bottom figures on Bismuth's data in the resection on the left versus transplant on the right. The survival rate was not that much different. It was about 50% versus about 35%. And then our own series, when I was still in Pittsburgh, looking at TMN related staging, patients with stage one in green, stage two in yellow, stage three in purple, and then stage four had an incremental survival benefit uh, with the lower stages having better survival at five years, about 77% um, survival rate. Next slide. So if you look at uh, post-transplant survival now, this is a little bit more modern series, about 10 years old. The three and five year survival rate go from about 40, 50% now to 80% for liver transplantation. At, five, at three years and 70% survival rate at five years with an uh, overall a resection survival rate that's also improved, but not as greatly as the transplant survival. So 73% survival rate at three years at 60% survival rate post-resection at five years. Whereas the RFA was about 10% less, 70% at three years and 50% at five years. So overall, the benefit of transplant over the surgical resection at five years was about 2.8 months and 5.7 months compared to RFA. Now, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but next slide. What you see is that you have to calculate survival benefit based on the entire area under the curve. So here in light blue is the survival estimates with resection alone. Whereas in the dark blue is a survival benefit with liver transplant. 
And that area under the curve really represents the difference, the overall benefit in survival for patients that undergo transplant compared to resection. Next slide. Now, the other thing I think is inherent in all this discussion is, and this is from Umberto Chilli's, Chilo's group in Italy. They looked at patients that underwent partial resection, anatomic, non-anatomic resection compared to transplant. And in figure A, you'll see the survival rate up to five, six, uh, sorry, up to seven years is no different or essentially the same. But if you look at the disease-free survival rate, you can see that the patients in panel B have a much higher disease-free survival rate compared to those patients that had undergone resection. And this will translate out at 5, 10, 15, 20 years to much better survival rate with the patients that undergo liver transplant. Next slide. So overall, the rationale for liver transplantation for HCC is summarized here. We know that most HCCs arise in the setting of underlying cirrhosis. And that clearly patients that have advanced cirrhosis that have poor liver function really cannot tolerate resection well. And we also know that in, when we look at large hepatectomy specimens, that patients with HCCs that we think are unifocal or single, uh, single uh, lesions will have Lesion, uh, secondary lesions in 20 to 60% of patients. And the larger the HCC lesion, the more chances that, that patient is going to have satellite nodules or, or multifocality. Uh, the current imaging is improving clearly, but it still underestimates the overall tumor burden in many patients. And after resection, as I showed you before, by five years, anywhere from 50 to 90% of patients that have a resection will have a recurrence. And we talked about cirrhosis as being a underlying premalignant condition. So um, we're always concerned after, after uh, local regional therapy or resection that these patients are still going to be at risk for developing HCC many years down the line. And so they require continuous uh, evaluation in imaging uh, to low, identify patients with those recurrences. And as those liver functions deteriorate from the primary disease, the patients will also be at risk for dying from their liver disease, whereas patients with liver transplantation, obviously their liver function is restored to normal. Next slide. In 1983, when uh, the NIH in the United States looked at the at utility of liver transplantation in general, they also already identified that HCC or primary liver uh, cancers, uh, not amenable for resections were an indication for transplant, but at that time they had a very high recurrence rate. And they felt that still in spite of that, the patients would have some palliative benefit. That's no longer acceptable. Palliation alone is not an indication for transplant. We need to demonstrate that we're able to cure these patients from their primary disease and from their HCC. Next slide. So early experience, and this is what they refer to in the NIH consensus conference. You can see here that the five-year survival rate in the early series before the, the advent of the Milan criteria and the association of stage with outcome, survival rates were less than 30% in many series. Uh, and this was unacceptable for an expensive and, and uh, high resource utilizing procedure like liver transplant. Next slide. So um, as I showed you this data from the Watsuki analysis from Pittsburgh showing the, the stepwise improvement in five-year survival rates after liver transplantation for HCC based on stage. So stage one disease had 75% survival rate of five years and stage four disease HCC patients had a five-year survival rate, 11%. Next slide. And this was then verified by Vincenzo Mazzaferro, who was also a fellow in Pittsburgh at this time, at that time, a few years later when they looked at uh, his own series in Milan it showed that patients with early stage disease, stage one and two, had better outcomes than patients that had stage three and four disease. And this is shown in the very famous New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, that then dubbed the criteria stage one and two as being 
within Milan criteria. So if you fit the Milan criteria, you had a 75% survival rate. Uh, and if you had fell outside of that, then you had only a 27% survival rate. Next slide. And so this is a Milan criteria, lesion list of single lesion less than five centimeters, or if you have multiple lesions, uh, none can be greater than three centimeters. They cannot have macrovascular invasion and obviously uh, no extra hepatic spread. Next slide. And when this criteria was applied to liver transplantation going forward, you can see that in, patient, in series where there was more selective uh, uh, selection in uh, patients, that the five-year survival rates improved uh, dramatically to 75% or higher. And so this is consistent with how our practice has evolved so that Milan criteria has been a sort of the universal threshold cutoff for um, uh, the selection of patients for HCC. Next slide. But I think with the improved uh, outcomes, uh, there have been a, a variety of different staging um, models that have looked at expanding the indications for transplant. So stage one and two for a, a Milan criteria, UCSF uh, started the concept of using a stage 3A. So the single tumor went from five centimeters to 6.5, and then the multiple tumors up to three uh, went from three centimeters to 4.5. And the total tumor diameter could not be more than eight centimeters. Again, no macrovascular invasion or extrapatic spread. Next slide. And then more recently, the new Milan criteria, what they called up to seven. And this is, uh, you can see all of the different permutations of nodules, numbers, and uh, the size of the lesions, not ex 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 exceeding seven. Uh, again, without macrovascular invasion or extrapatic spread. Next slide. And when you look at application of these different uh, types of, 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 of staging, Milan criteria, UCSF criteria, the Hanzo criteria in China, the Kyoto criteria in uh, Japan, and the Metro ticket up to seven, which is what I just mentioned from the Milan group, again, the new Milan criteria, there are five, if you see that with, they're all within this criteria expand, expanded from the Milan criteria that you can still get very good survival rates at uh, uh, five years, uh, up to 90% survival rate. And if, you're, if you go beyond that, you can see there are a dramatic decrease in overall survival. Next slide. So, in the United States, what we have seen over time is a gradual expansion of liver transplantation for HCC. And correspondingly, the number of patients with, that exceed Milan criteria have also increased over time. Next slide. So uh, within the United States, uh, we, our patients with HCC only get priority if they are within Milan criteria at the time of transplant, in other words, stage two or T2 lesion. So if you exceed that, we apply a technology or approach called downstaging. And this means that the original HCC is greater than a T2 lesion, stage two, uh, and we want to downstage them. And then they can uh, get in the waiting list and, and then be competitive for a transplant. So what is downstaging? Next slide. So downstaging simply means that you take a patient that's outside of your criteria for HCC and then you bring them within the criteria. How do you do that? Well, you have to downsize the site, the tumor. And this can be done by a variety of techniques, transarterial chemoembolization, transarterial radioembolization, local regional therapy like RFA, percutaneous ethanol injection, ultrasound, microwave technology, mm -hmm. external beam radiation, uh, and stereotactic radiotherapy that focuses the, the, the radiation in a smaller area. And even resection can be used to downstage. Next slide. Now, what's interesting is that we know that 
the time that it takes to downstage a patient from outside of the model criteria to within the model criteria, uh, that, that timing, that additional extra time also helps identify the biological behavior of the tumor. So this is uh, just a, a data that shows that, and it doesn't really matter what kind of downstaging technology you're using. This is uh, from the Mazafaro group. You can see that uh, patients within Milan criteria um, have a, then a G2, meaning the degree of differentiation greater than uh, moderate, I mean, less than moderate. So these are poorly differentiated lesions. That you know, within Milan criteria, only 13% uh, of patients have a poorly differentiated um, uh, staging uh, histology. And patients that exceed Milan criteria have a very high, uh, higher percentage of patients with uh, uh, histology that are poor prognosis, like uh, poor, um, uh, poorly differentiated lesions, up to 26%. And those patients that are exceed Milan criteria that you're able to successfully downstage you can see that only 16% of those patients have a uh, degree of differentiation that is less, that's greater than two, uh, poorly differentiated. And also this applies to microvascular invasion or MDI. Yeah, within Milan criteria, 11% of the specimens showed microvascular invasion. Whereas if you exceed Milan criteria, it's 39%. And those patients that are six, successfully downstaged have a lower incidence of both a microvascular invasion, only 20%. So patients that are able to be successfully downstaged have histologic predictors that are more likely, more alike patients with Milan criteria than those patients that exceed Milan criteria that are not responsive to therapy. Next slide. So if you look at a variety of different series with a variety of different technologies for downstaging, taste, combination therapy, radiotherapy, the overall response rate for patients outside Milan criteria here is about anywhere from 22% to 70%. In general, it's about 60%, 50 to 60%. And the time uh, that you have to wait uh, is around six months from the time the patients start their downstaging to the time they're listed and transplanted. But those patients that are successfully downstage, you can see their five-year overall survival rate is pretty good, anywhere from about 40% to 90%. I'd say the average is about 70 to 75%, which is the same as for Milan criteria patients. Next slide. So at the University of Chicago, we have started a protocol using uh, what we call a TAR, transarterial radial embolization. So the radioembolization uses microspheres that are impregnated, impregnated with yttrium-90. So yttrium-90 uh, is a highly radioactive substance. It's a beta-emitting uh, microparticle that embeds within the tumor capillary system and, and gives off radiation. Uh, and this radiotherapy permeates about 2.5 millimeters of tumor tissue and it minimizes the overall hepatic toxicity. Uh, and so you can give more radiation to a smaller volume and get more tumor effect. Next slide. So this is a, uh, a, a nice study uh, that looked at um, patients that had unresectable HCC uh, that were, ran, were, were treated either with uh, transarterial chemoembolization with minomycin, adriamycin, cisplatinum, as you showed uh, on the left side. These were mixed with lipiodol and injected into the tumor versus patients that were given yttrium-90 transarterial radioembolization, 126 of those. And so they looked at survival analysis and they looked at follow-up imaging. Next slide. And what they found was that the overall Reduction in tumor size was greater in patients that were given Y90, and the overall partial response was also higher, almost twice as high in the Y90 treated group. Median time was shorter. Uh, overall, it, and in some patients, complete response was identified. 6% of patients had a complete response. Downstaging, which is the most important thing for transplant from T3 lesion to T2 lesion, was 
obtained in 60% of the Y90 patients and only 30% of the taste patients. So you can see that overall time to progression was much longer. Overall survival was much higher in patients with that received Y90. So we applied this concept to our own uh, outside Milan criteria patients um, to get them into transplant. Next slide. Now, size obviously is important because it's a, an important indicator for all the things we talked about in terms of degree of differentiation, in terms of um, microbacillar invasion. But we also know that size is a very poor uh, overall, the con concordance with other types of HCC behavior is, is somewhat different. So HBV, HCC is different than HCV, HCC, which is different than NASH, HCC. So are there other types of biomarkers that we can use? Biochemical biomarkers, cell surface biomarkers, functional biomarkers, or genomic biomarkers? And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of these um, because I think it's important as we try to improve our outcomes for liver transplantation for HCC, that these are opportunities for us to do research, collect data, and then validate them using prospective studies. Next slide. So these are some of the biochemical, uh, the, the, the predictors of, of biological uh, aggressiveness. I'm, I've talked about uh, tumor grade, degree of differentiation, poor, moderate, and well differentiated, functional, uh, uh, parameters such as uh, uh, fluorodeoxy glucose uptake on PET scan. Uh, I'll talk about the genomic analysis, which is fractional allelic loss, and then biomarkers like alpha protein or PIVCA2 or uh, deoxycarboxy prothrombin. Next slide. So the, look at the, uh, this is just analysis, sub-analysis of the up to seven criteria from Milan. I, validate again that poorly differentiated tumors have a highly uh, statistically significant microvascular invasion, highly statistically significant macrovascular invasion, highly statistically significant. These are things that can um, help you select patients. Next slide. But you know some of these like microvascular invasion and poorly differentiated behave, uh, differentiate you, you won't be able to extract until the tumor's out, so it's too late. Um, PET scan, uh, we found to be very sensitive, uh, and this is data that extends uh, for many years now from the French series, from the Korean series, and now another US series, looking at um, patients that with HCC uh, and had a PET scan. So these are patients that have a, beyond my line criteria. If they have a very, um, if they have a high, uh, I'm mean, sorry, if they have a high uh, uh, PET uptake, in other words, they're very metabolically active. They're hot on PET scan. That means that these patients, these tumors tend to be poorly differentiated. You can see their survival in the yellow is very poor. Five-year survival rates are about 15%. Whereas the patients that have outside Milan criteria and PET scan, I mean, PET negative, in other words, they are not metabolically active. You can see those patients have a survival outcome very similar to patients that are within Milan criteria in the light blue. So increasingly, I think PET scan can be very helpful in stratifying patients that are outside Milan criteria that can be transplanted. Next slide. Uh, this is data from our, our own genomic analysis in Pittsburgh that's now been validated at Mount Sinai. And this is a concept of looking at uh, microsatellite uh, genetic mutations that occur in, in tumors. And so we know, for example, that you know, every, uh, um, every protein uh, co coding area has obviously two alleles and the alleles then will co-express themselves. And you can see uh, in the uh, picture in, right in front of you where it says no allelic loss, you can see that in those cases, you have a, uh, a two alleles for the same protein that uh, are both expressed uh, equally. 
if you have exa example on the very far right, um, a, a, a protein or loci uh, where one of the alleles is overexpressed, the other one's suppressed, it's what we call loss of uh, heterozygous, heterozygosity. And when that happens, it suggests that you have a, uh, a, a genetic change. We have 23 different markers that we can assess. We can calculate what we call a fraction allelic loss. In other words, if they were all the same, all the alleles were equal, that would be 100%, uh, 0 0% uh, allelic loss because they were all the same. Right. In other words, but if you had 100% of them had only one of this imbalance, then that would be 100% allelic loss. We never get that high, but next slide. So this is just an example of how you can stratify ge uh, genetically using these uh, uh, informative alleles to identify patients that are going to have um, tumor-free survival. So if the fractional allelic loss is less than 20%, you have the best outcomes. And if you have a fractional allelic loss greater than 40%, in other words, these tend to be poorly differentiated, fast growing tumors, their overall survival rate, disease-free survival rate is quite poor. And this is just an example from our work in Pittsburgh. The next slide, this data was validated at Mount Sinai by Mayor Myron Schwartz, again, looking at the same type of concept. Um, the patients with a fraction allelic loss of greater than 27% had the highest recurrence rate, 80% to 90% of them had recurrence versus those that had a low, less than 20% had a very low recurrence rate. So, you know, this is just a, another genetic biomarker for um, behavior of the tumor. Next slide. Yeah, next. Okay. What about, th those are research tools. They're not practical to do because you have to biopsy the tumor. You have to do these very sophisticated analysis. What about some of the readily available biomarkers? So we know alpha fetoprotein, for example, easy, easy to measure. And there is a very strong correlation between the level of alpha fetoprotein and the outcomes after transplant. This is uh, work from uh, the uh, European group by TASO uh, looking at uh, patients that have alpha fetoprotein in the less than 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 500, greater than 500. And you see patients that have alpha fetal protein greater than 500 at the time of transplant had the worst survival rates. You can see that in purple. Uh, and the patients that had alpha fetal protein at the time of transplant less than 10 had an excellent outcome. In fact, very similar to patients that have a alpha fetal protein of 10 to 20, I mean, 10 to 100. So different models have a different threshold for cutoff of alpha fetal protein. Next slide. What about other uh, biomarkers? Well, the use of deoxycarboxy, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, deoxy, des gamma carboxy prothrombin or, or uh, a PIVCA2. Uh, uh, DCP is a uh, uh, abnormal prothrombin that's made in the absence of uh, uh, vitamin K. That's what the PIVCA stands for. Uh, it's often excreted by uh, HCC. Um, uh, lesions, and you can see in this uh, data from Japan, the use of the DCP or PIFCA2 uh, identifies a high risk group of patients with recurrence. So, if the PIFCA2 is greater than 400 units per milliliter, you have a, almost a five fold increase, much higher than even alpha fetoprotein uh, in tumor size in terms of risk for recurrence. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to get away from the biomarkers and just talk about a little bit of some what, what is interesting in the area of post-transplant management. So it was first uh, observed uh, uh, almost 30 years ago by Itsu Yokoyama when he was a fellow in Pittsburgh. Uh, when he measured uh, tumors, HCC lesions, uh, in the lungs of patients that had um, a transplant versus no transplant, or in other words, that were exposed to immunosuppressive agents versus those that were not. And what he could measure over time was this change in size of the tumor. And he was able to calculate that in patients that had a uh, HCC recurrence after they were transplant that were on cyclosporin, so this is pre-FK506, uh, that their overall doubling time was around 
40 days. And that's by alpha feta protein or by measurement of the lung lesions. And patients that didn't have uh, a transplant, not exposed to, to um, uh, calcineur inhibitor, uh, these were the control patients. And he measured their, their growth rate. That uh, to, the tumor doubling time in the non immunosuppressed patients was 273 days. So over six times longer if they were not exposed to a CNI. Next slide. This was also validated in terms of a dose response curve. So that patients, this is from the, I mean, from uh, the Milan group and, uh, uh, by uh, Tony Pina's group. They looked at patients that uh, had recurrence versus those patients that didn't have recurrence. And they found that, the, and again, this is cyclosporin era, patients who had a recurrence had an overall exposure to cyclosporin that was significantly higher than patients who didn't have a recurrence. Next slide. So without getting into the reasons why calcineurin inhibitors are favorable for tumor um, growth, it goes without saying that a non-calcineurin inhibitor like serolimus, an mTOR inhibitor, uh, can actually uh, inhibit or not, not be favorable or promote tumor growth. And this is uh, some uh, in vitro data that showed that the mTOR inhibitor serolimus um, was able to inhibit tumor growth. And we know that serolimus and, and, and its drug, uh, a, a similar drug cousin, uh, everolimus, are antiproliferative agents. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about that later, but you can see here that uh, in this model, when they added to Cronus alone, the HCC's uh, growth increased, uh, but if they added uh, serolimus to the trachomus, they could inhibit the, the tumor cell growth up to uh, <coughs> 68% using a fairly high dose of serolimus. Next slide. So as it turns out that the mammalian target of rapamycin, mTOR pathway, is very important in um, tissue growth as well as tumor growth. So it acts at, at the level of angiogenesis. It acts as a growth <coughs> uh, inhibitor. It uh, also is important in, it, obviously, immunity. <coughs> and uh, um, these mTOR inhibitors <coughs> me, have been used and are actually approved for use in certain cancers such as renal cell carcinoma, also uh, in neuroendocrine tumors, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. So mTOR inhibitors we know are uh, uh, antiproliferative as well as uh, potentially used as a anti-tumor uh, agent. Next slide. So this is um, the uh, structural uh, the structure of the uh, mTOR inhibitors that are available in the United States, Everolimus, which is the hydroxymethyl uh, metabolite of um, serolimus. But uh, you can see the biochemical uh, differences, the pharmacologic differences are quite different. Uh, the half-life of Everolimus is uh, much shorter. It uh, is twice a day um, uh, drug versus serolimus, which is once a day. Uh, the Plasma binding protein uh, a component of is, is lower with everolimus. The tra target trough levels are lower. And so uh, the biological behavior is the same, but the pharmacologic differences are quite different. Next slide. So some of the evidence that serolimus is actually helpful in patients with HCC comes from uh, Christian Tasso's uh, analysis of the uh, American uh, uh, SRTR, the Scientific Registry for Transplant Recipients. And this is an older paper, but I think it's very interesting because uh, they had 2,500 HCC patients and 12,000 non-HCC patients. And you can see the demographics a little bit different, but having said that, if you look at the next slide, what they found was that patients that were given serolimus uh, had a, and that's uh, on the left-hand column, what, th three rows down. If you look at patients with HCC, 
that got seromimus, their survival rate at three years was 85.6% versus patients who didn't get seromimus, whose survival rate was 79.2%. And that was highly significant. On the other hand, if you look at the non-HCC patients, the patients with give, there was, were on tacrolimus and cyclosporin actually had a better survival rate if they were on those agents than if they weren't. And so the calcineurin inhibitors are bad for cancer patients. mTOR inhibitors are good for cancer patients and it's vice versa in the non-cancer patients. I would just point out one other thing which I think is very interesting. Uh, and we've integrated into our own protocol. If you look all the way down at the very bottom, the second to the bottom in the bread box, it says anti-CD25. So anti-CD25 is a basiliximab, decluzumab. It's a, a monoclonal antibody to the uh, IL-2 receptor alpha chain um, receptor. And this CD25 marker is found on many activated T cells, including uh, mem uh, memory T cells and, and, and also um, T regulatory cells. And it's interesting that the use of the anti-CD25 monoclonal antibody in HCC patients was actually protective. If you look at the survival rate of patients who got induction with basiliximab or decluzumab, the three-year survival rate was 88% compared to 78.5% patients who didn't get it. And uh, in the non-HCC patients, there was no statistical difference. And we have some evidence in experimental models. The reason for this is that the anti-CD25 targets the T regulatory cells in the HCC patients, which suppress the immune system to um, HCC. So we've integrated into our own protocol. We use induction basiliximab as well as the mTOR inhibitors post-transplant. Next slide. So this is just a graphic of what I showed you before, everolimus based immunosuppression versus uh, immun uh, mTOR inhibitor free in terms of HCC survival. Next slide. And this was validated in a study actually called the SILVER study. This was a multi-centered study done in Europe. Uh, and you can see that the two curves, one is overall survival rate on the left and disease-free survival on the right. This was a randomized blinded study. And I would just show you that uh, this is actually an interesting interpretation of this data. Uh, this data was, this study, the conclusion was that there was no benefit for the mTOR inhibitors, serolimus. But what you really see is, and I'll explain, give you my explanation, that in the first three years after liver transplantation, the patients that were given mTOR inhibitor serolimus actually had a better survival rate and better disease-free survival. And these were the curves on the red. The patients who didn't get serolimus are in the blue. So then the question is, well, why did the curves come back together at three to five years? Well, as it turns out that, you know, serolimus has side effects. It causes elevation in cholesterol level. It causes aphthous ulcers in the mouth. Some patients, it causes edema in the legs. It causes proteinuria. Patients don't like it. So by the time the study ended, almost half the patients that were on the serolimus arm stopped taking it. So what I think had happened was that many of the centers and the patients at three years were free of tumor on serolimus, and then their doctor said, you don't have to take it anymore. So having said that, I'll show you the next study. The next study is uh, a registration study of the mTOR inhibitor everolimus. And I won't go into much, too much detail with the way the, the study was structured. Next slide except just to show you that there were three arms of the study. Everolimus was given to the first two groups. Everolimus plus reduced host tacrolimus and with tacrolimus withdrawal. The first two columns were everolimus-based groups, TAC control, TAC controls on the right. And you can see here the number of patients with HCC uh, were equally distributed, uh, about 65 to 69 in each group. Uh, overall, the tumor characteristics were very similar. Uh, these were mostly patients within Milan criteria. Next slide. 
And the recurrence rate in the patients that were given Everolimus was shown here at one year, two years, and three years compared to patients that were on tacrolimus control. So these were highly significant, at least. Uh, this was not the primary endpoint, so just remember that. But having said that, uh, the recurrence rates were redu reduced by almost 70% uh, in the um, patients that were given uh, Everolimus. Next slide. And just to show you that this same phenomena occurs in living donor liver transplants, this is a study that was primarily done in Asia, uh, again, using Everolimus uh, in liver transplantation. Next slide. And then the patients with HCC, here are many more patients with HCC, 142 in each group. You can see that the overall recurrence rate was 1.8% uh, at two years in the Everolimus treated group and almost 10% in the Tacrolimus treated group. Uh, and deaths associated with them are, are relatively early at two years. But overall, you can see that the number of patients with HCC in the Tacrolimus control group was higher than in the Everolimus control group, uh, the Everolimus treated group. Next slide. So I'll just conclude that, you know, we. Clearly, HCC is a big problem. It's increasing around the United, around the United States and the rest of the world. Um, the management of HCC uh, depends, as uh, we know from the Asian experience, is heavily determined by when you catch it. When did you make the diagnosis? So the earlier the stage, the better control of the underlying liver disease, the better the outcomes are going to be. Uh, liver transplantation um, is an effective way to treat unresectable HCC, particularly in patients with liver disease. Uh, and we know that the correlation of stage, size of the tumor, different degree of differentiation, as, and the risk of a recurrence uh, is a, a something that uh, we're, we're very aware of, uh, that the problem is if we stick only to Milan criteria, many patients that potentially could be saved with liver transplantation will not be. Uh, and while organ, uh, organ shortage is a problem, that if we start using things like living donor liver transplants, uh, and split livers, I think at DCDs, we can definitely um, improve the availability of livers for patients with HCC. And since HCV is no longer an indication for transplantation in the United States, we, we hardly see patients with HCV any longer, then we have those uh, uh, livers that we normally would have transplanted and to uh, then use those in patients with HCC. Next slide. I think the biggest issue going forward is to further do research on the risk factors, looking at biomarkers um, that we talked about a little bit, some of the novel downstaging therapies and use of neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapies, and then you know refine what we're currently doing in terms of post-transplant in immunosuppression, immunotherapy, uh, and then some of the uh, these new um, kinase inhibitors uh, that are less toxic than serafinib. Next slide. I think that's it. So that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have anything. Yes, I guess uh, we have plenty of questions, actually, Professor. Uh, so, especially about your immunosuppressive, immunosuppressive protocol, I was very interested on that. So, uh, normally now in Chicago for HCC, uh, sirolimus is, is uh, one of the main uh, drugs in, the, uh, in your immunosuppressive protocol every time, since the very beginning, or, or do you start it after a certain time because of the fear of arterial thrombosis or something like that? Or yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so when we have a patient with HCC, first of all, we do use the induction vasoliximab, as I mentioned, the anti-CD25. That's two okay. injections, one on day one and one on day five. Uh, and then we use standard tacrolimus uh, until one month after transplant. And so the issue, the concern of uh, hepatic artery thrombosis that was seen in the early serolimus trials that time frame of risk for hepatic artery thrombosis is gone away. Uh, so we don't start de novo serolimus or everolimus is what we use in the United States now um, until one month after transplant. 
all the wound healing is completed, all of the anastomosis are healed. Uh, and then we convert them from tacrolimus to everolimus. And that conversion takes about three to four weeks. Uh, and we gradually reduce the tacrolimus level, we gradually increase the, the everolimus level. And ideally it would be best to maintain them on monotherapy. But the, the only concern about the mTOR inhibitors using monotherapy is that they have, have a tendency for the patients to become anemic and thrombos uh, and neutropenic. In other words, the growth factors that are important for the myeloid um, line of, of, of bone marrow, the erythroid and the platelets are suppressed by the mTOR inhibitors also. It's an anti-proliferative agent. So uh, in that setting, we often cannot use maximum doses of uh, everolimus. We have to use a combination of everolimus and, and tacrolimus but we minimize the tacrolimus dose and we maximize our everolimus dose to fit within the parameters of the white count primarily. Okay. Uh, just would like to uh, check if uh, Dr. Silvana has any questions to add or anybody who's, uh, uh, who's in the room. I think his uh, presentation was so brilliant that uh, nobody has any... <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, I think. <laughs> but I have one, uh, Dr. Fong. Yeah. Uh, regarding the downstaging, when you're talking about uh, comparing uh, chemo and e 90 do you think that uh, they have any impact on the recurrence of HCC afterwards, but after the transplant? Like, when you, you, you get it downstaging, but uh, do you think that they make any difference when you use one or other? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Does the type of downstaging technique uh, have a difference? Our, my experience is that I've used transarterial chemoembolization, we've used radio frequency ablation, we've used microwave ablation, um, and we've had some experience with proton beam therapy. The Y90 to me has, um, and the proton beam therapy, probably the most effective downstaging for local regional therapy. Um, the proton beam therapy is not widely available. Uh, it does have um, difficulty and uh, it's very effective. It, it, it will kill the tumor. Uh, Cyber knife will kill the tumor. Uh, Y90 will also be very effective. Uh, it's just that I, the Y9, I mean, sorry, the proton beam is not something that's easily available. And, mm -hmm. and it does have, I wouldn't use it in the hilum because uh, when we're doing liver resection, for example, with a patient who has proton beam therapy, um, the, the tissue destruction of that is amazing. Uh, it's not quite so much for Y90 because we use super selective in, in injection into the, the arteries feeding the tumor. So we tend not to get a lot of toxicity. Both all these therapies are expensive. Probably the microwave uh, in a developing country that uh, you know, maybe that has cost issues or, or resource issues, microwave is probably pretty effective also. Um, but I don't, nobody's done a head to head comparison of chemo versus, um, you know, any of the other local regional therapies. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think that we don't, I don't think we have any other questions here. Um, I have just one, just one now. Um, do you use uh, everolimus or serolimus in your patients uh, that you transplant for HCC? It, yeah. This is the question. So the other benefit of using the mTOR inhibitors, and this was the primary outcome of the studies that I was showing you, is not actually its effect on HCC. That was a byproduct. The real benefit of using the mTOR inhibitors and this is true with serolimus and everolimus, is that they are, since they're not calcium neuron inhibitors, they don't have the nephrotoxicity. And so the renal function is also preserved. So we use it in patients that have bad renal function. We also use it in patients with HCC. So there's a, a secondary benefit. Uh, in, there's a primary benefit in all transplant patients, which is reducing uh, calcium neuron toxicity, nephrotoxicity. And uh, a secondary benefit in HCC patients that appears to reduce the risk of HCC recurrence. Okay. 
And, and which one do you use uh, most, like uh, Everlim or Sirolim? Well, it's easier to use Everlimus. And the reason okay. is that the dosing is twice a day versus once a day. And so the adjustments that you're making are, are smaller um, and you can make them more rapidly. S because you're using Ever a Seromus once a day, the C max is much higher for Seromus than the C max is for Everolimus. The AUCs are similar, but the overall once a day gives you a much higher C max. The problem is with the mTOR inhibitors is that the higher the C max, the more side effects you get. So the more wound complications you get, the more hypercholesterolemia you get, the higher uh, the bone marrow suppression. So Everolimus, in my experience, is uh, easier to deal with than Serolimus. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, yeah, I have another question, sir. So uh, you said in, in uh, nowadays in the states uh, you were all um, you still respect the Milan criteria. Well, from and an allocation the standpoint, we we select patients outside Milan cr criteria, but we don't are unable to give them any priority. Okay. For they don't get extra points, they get no priority unless they are in Milan criteria. So we have to downstage them if we think that they're um, if they want to get extra points. And uh, in the situation that a patient is uh, is in, in Milan criteria because of the size and the number of tumors, but he has high alpha protein levels, how do you deal with this kind of patient in the States? Well, so we know the alpha feed protein, as you uh, suggested, is, a, is, not a great, is not a good criteria, but it, it's not the only um, criteria we use alone. So if the patient has a very high alpha feed of protein and they don't respond to local regional therapy, then we're a little bit more reluctant to transplant them. But if, for instance, they have an alpha feed of protein of a uh, thousand and now you give them local regional therapy and their alpha feed of protein goes to 100 and they're stable then for, so the allocation in the United States is that the patients don't get priority for HCC unless they're on the waiting list for six months. So that gives you that period of time to assess what is the tumor doing? Is the alpha free protein goes down and it comes back or is it goes down and stays down? Those are the patients that goes down and stay down, there would be good candidates. If they come down and they go back up uh, within the six month period, then they probably aren't gonna be very good candidates. Okay, and then the final question, sir. Uh, just would like to know, how do you deal with a patient that have recurrence after a certain time and they're still in the um, Millen criteria? Do you uh, would uh, recommend a uh, hepatectomy or eventually a transplantation or how do you deal with this sort of patient that uh, recur after a year? Yeah. But they're so still in the Millen criteria. Most of them that recur won't recur within the liver. Um, but if they do, you know, they probably have micropotassies everywhere. It's very rare to re-transplant somebody for recurrent HCC. Now, things may be different. There's some data that immunotherapy may be uh, one, another approach to downstaging the patient. We haven't had much experience. Uh, everybody's a little reluctant, I think, um, giving somebody immunotherapy and the tumor goes away then if you immunosuppress them, what's the tumor going to do? So I think that that question hasn't been answered yet. There, there are some positive results in the literature cases here and there, but uh, immunotherapy is still a big unknown. Um, I think most patients who have recurrences after transplant with HCC are probably not going to be transplant cases. I can't remember the last time we transplanted somebody with recurrent HCC. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we had just a few cases, the cases that we had, we mostly treated those with uh, uh, local therapy or chemoembolization most of the time. And I think uh, once we had one that we had just resected segment two. I, mean, I would be aggressive if they have a lung lesion or they have a single solitary metastasis to the liver. I would go and, and resect it or ablate it. But generally, those yeah. patients tend to have diffuse disease. Uh, so, Wendy, there's a question. Would you, could you read, please, in the um, chat? Uh, yes. Um, it, it's, uh, he's asked, uh, Dr. Garcia, he's asking if the level of uh, AFP has uh, any influence 
and uh, and the HCC criteria for transplant, even if the patient is, uh, if the tumor is in the Milan criteria. Yeah. We don't have a, a cutoff. You know, if you look at the Kyoto, it's 400. Uh, the Hanzo criteria is 500. Um, most centers will use 200 or 400. If it's 1,000 uh, and they're within the Milan criteria, we would still probably transplant them, but we would give them re local regional therapy first. So if they're within Milan criteria, normally we don't give them local regional therapy. Here, what we would do is give them local regional therapy if the HCC, alpha fetoproteins dropped and stayed down, then we would transplant them. If they never come down, then it usually suggests that they have a metastases that you, can't, you, have look, you haven't found yet. Great. Thank you, sir. Yeah, because uh, here in Brazil, sir, just to explain you the reason of this question, is that we normally respect all over the country a cutoff of 1,000 for AFP. So that's yeah, why I think the, the cutoff, what you use, is not that important as long as you relative, you have you know, some threshold. But yes. so in the United States, I think most centers will use 400. Okay, I see. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, is there any other question? Final one? Yes. Uh, so, um, sir, not to, uh, uh, to abuse <laughs> of your time and your availability, I uh, just would like to make a final uh, thank to you. Thank you very much indeed for your availability, your kindness, and the high quality of your presentation. It was very useful for, uh, for all of us. We have a mixture of oncologists, gastroenterologists. We have some students as well. So it was pretty important, especially for some discussion that we've been dealing quite a lot in the last years and months, especially in our service, with the question concerning the AFP, as we said, and the, uh, the best immune suppression and uh, stuff like this. So thank you very much indeed for this uh, very, very good update of the subject. And thank you very much as well for the Dr. Silvania, we, which was one of our best HPB surgeons here in the city. Yeah. I'm very pleased that she accepted the invitation to be with us tonight. And uh, so for all the people who we are, that are with us tonight, because uh, it was very, very important, especially for a Tuesday night. To, uh, Great. Spend well, so on, it's nice to see you again. And um, thank you. Uh, Jao, thank you very much for the invitation to participate. And uh, if I can be of any assistance in the future, you know, uh, let me know. If you have another opportunity, I'd be happy to participate. Thank you, thank sir. You. I hope thank to you so see much. you personally right. uh, in, the, in the near future. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Okay. Obrigado. Boa noite a todos. Boa noite. Bye. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.